Now, I drink coffee to calm down. I was born wired. I just was born wired. But I, I love coffee, and I love stiff, very, very strong coffee. I like a super dry cappuccino that they hand to you in a cup that has just about this much liquid in it. And I throw that thing back and then I just praise God out loud for it. <laughs> but I had had about six shots one morning and I've been working out of Colossians in my memory work. So I was saying my memory work to the Lord. I was starting at the very beginning and I said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the faints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. <laughs> and so every time I turn to this book, I think about the faints and the faithful brothers uh, in Colossae. And so that may be you today. You may be faint of heart. You are in the right place. Colossians chapter 2, I want to read you verses 1 through 7. So much of this segment would be a lesson all by itself. We are heading together to the seventh verse, but I want you to see verses one through six as well as we prepare for it. It says, and this is the Apostle Paul talking to the faints and faithful brothers in Colossae, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Let me pause there to say, it is all right with God if you and I have to really struggle to see somebody become in Christ what they were called to be. Anybody know what I'm talking about? To be able to press in there, go to the work, go to the grip that it takes to see somebody that you know full well has the capacity and gifting in them to be so instrumental in the body of Christ. I've got a young woman in my life like this right now she is so gifted she has got an authority on her she can um stand up and speak to a group but i mean she has the mouth of a sailor anybody know what i'm talking about and you know I, you know what's going to happen is a sailor is going to write me and say you know what i don't have a bad mouth so uh, forgive me you may be a sailor with a wonderful sanctified mouth i'll, I'll try to think of something else but y'all know what i'm talking about and i'm trying to struggle in there with her, that there be a sanctification that would release the gifting on that mouth. Sometimes we struggle with one another to see one another come to their gifting and their sanctification in Christ. Look, look at verse 2. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. I just want you to land on verse 3. I want somebody new to hear this. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Everybody say, all the treasures. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's no way to get to the bottom of them. I, I need you to know something. I have been um, enthralled and fascinated by the scriptures for 30 solid years because there's just no way to get to the bottom of it, to get it all explained. You can't lasso the thing. You can't control the thing. You can't make it behave. You can't bring yourself complete understanding and work out every single thing, get all of your doctrinal ducks in a row, have every one of your questions answered. You just cannot take all the mystery out of him. And you cannot take all the mystery out of his word. You can spend the rest of your life seeking him and searching him out on the pages of his word and never, ever exhaust it. It is unlike anything else you could possibly hold in your hands. It says this in verse 4, I say this, in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, Paul says to them, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Here we go. Six and seven are the primary verses that we'll be launching from in this present series. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Everybody say walk in him. Amen. So walk in him. Verse seven, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse seven again, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, 
just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now listen, um, we're going somewhere else with our concept, but I don't want to go there before I mention the words where it says rooted and built up in him, rooted. You and I are heading toward the words built up, but I want you to think about rooted for a moment because I want you to see the trajectory. I'm a visual learner like many of you are, and so I'm already picturing some things happening on the page right now because it says walk with him as you received him, walk with him. So you've got a horizontal move going here and then there's this vertical work going so a horizontal walk we're going forward with him just as we've received him we're going to walk in him but we're going to be rooted and we're going to be built up rooted and built up down below us with depth up above us pulling us stretching us making us taller in the faith building us up and I started thinking it's so important that you and I realize that our rootedness has to be in him not just rooted in our church and I'm a church girl I I believe in the local church I love the local church I encourage you get into a local church but if what we're rooted in is a group of our Christian friends a, a, a social circle, we're rooted in our job, we're, we're rooted um, in our exact family situation, we're rooted in this particular city, we're rooted in this neighborhood, I'm rooted in this particular house, then what happens when we get uprooted? But let me tell you something, when you get rooted in Jesus Christ, no, no man No woman, no thing can uproot you because no matter where you go, you're taking the roots with you. Anybody got that with me? Rooted in him, rooted in him. That's that's what holds my feet to the ground. That's what keeps me standing. And then it says what's going to become so important to us in our present series. It says then rooted and built up in him. I want everybody to say those words back. Built up in him. Say it back. Say it one more time. We're, we're going to learn how to be built up in him and not just beaten up by the world. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because listen, you can get beaten up out there. Anybody but me? I, I, I thought about something uh, this week. I thought about the fact that Jesus must surely have an affinity for carpentry. Don't you think he does? I mean, he does all things. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He, he knows every occupation. He knows how to do your job. He has complete and infinite understanding of everything it takes to do the work that you have been ordained for. And yet, you know, there's got to be some kind of tenderness in his heart for building things. Wouldn't you imagine when you imagine that he just loves construction. I mean, isn't it what he said to his disciples on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus is a builder, a builder. I was sitting in my house a couple of days ago, getting ready for you, getting ready for this series and, and to come and teach. And um, we, we live way out in the country outside of Houston. And my son-in-law was is in the process of building a tree house for our grandchildren that are just about to have their birthdays. They are just about to turn. They're just two weeks from one another um, in their birthdays, and they're about to turn nine and six, so they're the perfect age for it. And he said, he told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, do you care if I, I pick a spot and if I build them a tree house? That's what I'm going to give both of them for their birthday. So I was in my library preparing for you, and I could hear in the distance the hammering, and I could hear the sawing, and I could hear the country western music play. Now, I don't know. I don't know if Jesus would have, would have um, had that exact scenario or not. Maybe he would have. Maybe he would have loved him a little George Strait. Somebody know what I'm saying to him? <laughs> but it was the most wonderful thing, and I went by to see if he wanted any lunch while I went to grab me some. And I looked at him, and I thought, you know, it was just that his contentment was palpable. Something so satisfying. He's a young pastor got a lot of pressure on him all the time uh, a lot a lot of work uh, never gets to the end of the list uh, many of you know how that is whatever your profession may be but something about I'm going to put this 
board here. I'm going to take this nail. I'm going to hammer the thing, and it's actually going to stay. For every woman or man cleaning up around a house full of people, you know what it's like that you do this, and it never stays. But something about construction, could I just put that nail through that board and know the satisfaction that it is going to stick for at least five minutes. Anybody <laughs> getting that with me? An affinity for building things and what you and I are going to find before this series is over. Not just building things, but that Jesus is more than willing to rebuild. Anybody? Amen. To rebuild a thing. So I was sitting back a few days ago, and I thought, you know, I, I just want to make two observations to you. These are not big biblical observations. These are world life observations. This is just from being my age, walking around um, planet Earth, watching what's going on and living my own life. I came to two observations. I thought, number one, there is a whole lot of wear and tear involved in being a human can I just say that? A lot of wear and tear, a lot of wear and tear. Listen, I don't, I don't know anything about what your life may be like on the other side of that screen because I cannot see you and, and what you're dealing with and, and, um, and uh, where you are uh, planted in your life experience. But this I know, you don't have to be a Christian, you don't have to have a personal relationship with God to be in a life with a whole lot of wear and tear. There's just a, listen, you get this point because you know that just to be a human, there's a whole lot of wear and tear going on. Anybody got that with me? But here was that follow-up observation I came to right after that. In Christ, please hear this with me, there is a whole lot of patch and mend. A lot of wear and tear out there. But what I just want to suggest to you in this present series is that in Christ, there's also a lot of patch and mend. Listen, about a year ago, I learned something that kind of turned my, my understanding inside out about a passage. I am almost positive I even brought it uh, to the Wednesday uh, program, but it would have been a while, and I think about it often, so just let me bring it back if it's not new to you, but it's just hitting me so fresh with this lesson about rebuilding and seeing things sewn back together. I was doing a um, conference on the whole concept of time in the Word of God, and so, of course, you have to go to Ecclesiastes 3. Because it says that there's a time to do this, and there's a time to do that, and there's a time to do this, and there's a time to do that. And there's this wonderful verse in Ecclesiastes 3, 7, where it says, there is a time to tear, time to tear, and a time to sow. And so I was, I was doing some uh, commentary research on it when one of the commentators pointed out that very likely it was talking about the same fabric. And what it was talking about was the mourning process. I mean, it could have been anything because there is a time to tear and there's a time to sow. But he was suggesting that in this ancient world, it could very likely have been exactly the same piece of material. In other words, it was talking about that when someone was grief stricken or when they were um, hit with a uh, a terrible crisis or turmoil, one of the things they would do in the ancient world and certainly um, the ancient Jewish world is that they would tear, they would tear their cloak. They would tear their robe. And the commentator was pointing out that it, they weren't like us, where they just went into their closet, I mean, throw away what's torn, just get rid of it, put it out for the trash man. They didn't have like this whole wardrobe of um, clothing in a closet like we do. That that same robe, very often, over time, would have then been pulled back out, stay with me, and sewn back up, representing that, yes, we do get torn apart, but make no mistake, for people of faith, we get sewn back up. Somebody needs to hear that today. And this is where it differs completely whether or not we are a human being out there who does not know God or if we know the living Lord Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you, there is no terror he cannot mend. So 
somehow you and I have been created in the infinite mercy of God with this thing called, that the world calls, that Webster's would call resilience. Think about it with me. Resilience. Now, let, let me tell you what's, what's also true. There are things that we don't necessarily bounce back from for years and years and years and years. But that's not our present series. I want you to find our present series refreshing because here's what our present series is about. That God has somehow woven our souls in such a way where they are prone to the mending of God. I want you to be able to glance back and look over your shoulder and appreciate the times in your life when actually something should have completely taken you out. And yet, lo and behold, here you are. This is what I want to talk to you about in the present series. All the times that something should have knocked you down where you could not have gotten back up for 20 solid years. Yet here you sit. There you stand. That very woman, that very man will get in the car and drive to work. Should have been completely taken out. This thing called resilience. Listen, so much we still hurt over, but that is not what our present series is about. This series is about holy resilience. Uh, Things that should have taken 20 years that actually took 10. Things that should have taken 10 years but actually took one. Things that should have taken one year, but you know, actually, I worked through that with the Lord Jesus Christ in a month. Things that should have taken a month that ended up taking a week. Things that should have taken a week that ended up taking a day. I just want to present the concept to you that sometimes, sometimes we come back from something stunningly fast. This series is about appreciating that, knowing that can exist, it actually can happen, and come into a place where we find a gratitude for it. I'm not talking about shortcuts here. I believe in the process of healing, the process of wholeness, lifelong sanctification, lifelong growing in the scriptures and growing in our relationship with Christ. I'm not talking about shortcuts I'm talking about letting a work go so deep where it plunges there instead of seeps and seeps and seeps and seeps one slow drop at a time. What if we removed every defense and just said to God, go for it. I will hold nothing back from you. I will not put my hand over my heart. I will not put my hand over my head. You have full access. This doesn't have to be like pulling teeth. You just, Lord, go for it. Go for it. What, what if that happened? Because listen, not every lasting work has to be long. Would that be refreshing to anybody? I looked up resilience. This is just one definition of it just out there um, on the web. It says this. Just just listen to it. Resilience af, uh, out of um, dictionary um, on uh, the Internet it says this. The ability to recover quickly from illness, change, or misfortune. Buoyancy. I love that word. Buoyancy. Just the ability to come back up float back up. I love this one. This is the second part of the definition. The property of a material that enables it to resume its original shape or position after being, listen, bent, stretched, or compressed. I mean, go go those three places with me. How, how's your week been? Anybody just like been bent, stretched, or I love the opposite of stretched, just compressed. I mean, like, no, you're just like packed up. Somebody could put you in their purse today. You know what I'm saying? That's what we're talking about here. This lesson, this present series is about getting our bounce back. Look at one another and say, it's time to get your bounce back. I mean, would anybody be 
the end of that? Would anybody think that would be refreshing to just get a little bounce back? We don't have to take 20 years off of us to get some bounce back. We could have it right now at exactly this point in our lives. I started looking up verses. I love a concordance so much. I love just running a word and seeing every single place that it appears in the word of God. So I ran the word speedily. Anybody? <laughs> it was a wonderful thought. It was a wonderful thought. You would be so glad to know there are some things that God does speedily. Anybody need to know that? Listen to some of these verses that are us crying out to him for a speedy word. Psalm 102, verse 2, it says this, Incline your ear to me, answer me speedily in the day when I call. Psalm 79, verse 8 is very similar to it. It says this, Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. I love that. I love that. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. So going that way, moving that direction, we're trying to move toward him, draw near to God, and we're going, let, draw near quickly. Come to me quickly. Let your compassion come speedily to me. Isaiah 51, 14, this is the Lord God to his people. He who is bowed low shall speedily be released. Speedily. Anybody? Anybody think it would be such a wonderful thing for something not to just take half a forever? <laughs> Anybody? Just like pull the word immediately back into your vocabulary, Lord. I mean, are there some things we can do that we can just get the thing done? Just get the thing done. Because I started thinking, you know, Word of God tells us this. And with God, sometimes a day is like a thousand. Maybe your day today has been like that. It's been a thousand days long. I mean, sometimes I get into bed that night and I think I have lived 14 days since dawn this morning. Anybody else? Sometimes a day is like a thousand, but sometimes with God... A thousand years is like a day. I want to say this to you today. What if it turned out that we were not nearly as fragile as we thought we were? Wouldn't that be lovely? All sorts of things put us in the situation to realize that we're not as strong as we think we are. But I, I want to pull us around to a different side of the table in this present series. And I want us to look at times when maybe we had every opportunity to be crumbled and disintegrated. And God built us back up without it taking half a forever. Not very long ago, I just got so um, astounded over something going on in the body of Christ and something going on in the infighting and name-calling and slander out there in um, the Twitterverse and in Facebook and in blogs and all of this. I just got fed up with something in particular, and I sounded off about it on a blog. And let me tell you something. Have you ever known you were going to get it? <laughs> I mean, I knew. I knew I was. I knew I was. But I'm just going to tell you something. Just because you know someone's about to punch you in the face does not mean that it is an anesthetizing effect on you. Somehow when it hits, it still hurts. And let me tell you, it was a free-for-all. Now, the beauty of it was I, I felt I, I stand by it. I, st I knew it then. I knew this this is what I believe to be truth. This is what I believe to be God's will. This is what I believe to be right in the body of Christ. And I believe this slander is out of place. But I knew that in calling it that, I was going to get it back. And of course, so many loving people. But the thing about mean people is that they are loud and boisterous. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, it just is like, it just did not let up. And so it just, I mean, it kind of went on. And I had this day um, that I just was like, I mean, I felt like if someone had mugged me 
in an alleyway and left me almost dead, I could not have been more bruised up and bloody than I felt. Anybody ever felt that way? That maybe you were not bearing any physical wounds. Maybe you were not bruised. Maybe both of your eyes were not black to people that were standing in front of you. But as surely, as surely as you could stand to your feet, you knew that that's what you would have looked like if somebody could see your soul. Just, just beaten up. And I lived that, that day. It was one of those days that seemed to go on for, um, forever. And, you know, where you just like no appetite, just like good grief. I mean, good grief. Just that kind of day. Well, the next morning, you know, I, I got out of bed and I was like, oh, one of those kind of days. And, you know, I love the morning. I, I, God gave me a gift of energy from childhood. I like to get up. I love to see the sun come up. I love it. But that particular day was like, okay. And it was a Sunday morning. It was like, I'm going to church. I'm going to church. I'm just going to get this woman up. I'm going to get this woman dressed. I'm going to get this woman's mascara on her and I am going to church. You know, just feeling sick all over. When was the last time you went that you just felt sick all over? Well, I get there. I get there and my, um, if my man is with me, um, then we don't sit toward the front where my daughter is. My daughter is the pastor's wife and so she has to sit on the front row. So if, if T's not there, I sit up with her. But we were sitting kind of further back and so my other daughter was sitting with us. I don't know why I want you to picture it, but there you go. <laughs> But we were having worship, and while we were worshiping, I just was like, my soul was just kind of one little, one little piece after another, kind of coming back together. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and then the Word of God came. I mean, all of this happened over an hour and 15 minutes. The Word of God was taught and preached by my um, son-in-law pastor. I mean, he brought us a word. And then at the end of it, it just was like it could not have been more perfect because we took the elements. And it's the most beautiful thing. I just love it. I love taking communion. I love taking it at our church where you walk up and someone offers it to you. And because I know most of these uh, people that are in these serving capacities, um, they will say to me uh, when I look up at them and they hold it out to me, Miss Beth, the body of Christ broken for you. Look at the chills on Mars. Just, just kills me. Just, I can hardly take it without wanting to cry. And, and so we get in the car and we go meet all of our people. So all of them are there then. My daughter and my son-in-law and our two grandkids that are the most delicious age ever. And, and my um, younger daughter and my husband. And listen, these human beings are hilarious. I know no other way to put it. Very, very quirky people, but absolutely hilarious. And we laugh the kind of hard, hard laughing that you do. I mean hard, where you can hardly sit up. And we got in the car by ourselves, just Keith and I. I looked over at him and I said, it's the craziest thing. I was so broken this morning. And I drive away home. What is that? What is that? That in just a little while, Drove off in one piece, just like that. I'm going to tell you something. You've had times like those. That's what I want to bring back to your remembrance. But I want to say this to you today, and I want to say this to every single one of you today. You will have times like that again. Oh, yes, you will. Oh, yes, you will. I have come this series to say this to you. Not everything Big has to be hard to get over. Could somebody go there with me? Don't assume it must. Don't force it to. Listen, we will put our, a sentence on ourselves. We will say of ourselves, I, it will take me the rest of my life to get over this. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I will never love again. I will never put myself out there again. I, I will never, ever expose my heart like that again. I'll never be part of a church like that again. Now, I mean, we put this sentence on us that says, I will never get over this. This series is about pulling that sentence off, giving God full access to your heart 
and mind to build you back up and put you back together again in a way you did not even know you could exist. Can anybody go there with me? Could anybody believe that that could happen? That sometimes some things don't take as long to get over as they took to happen. There's something I want you to see. It says building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, how do we do that? Because we know that at no time can we be any less loved of God than we were the moment before. It's impossible. He loves us completely. He loves us infinitely. He loves us unconditionally. And never let that, that thought um, lose its uh, hold and its awe in you. It is an incredible thing. You don't know anybody else that just completely loves you unconditionally. I mean, there's flat out nothing you can do to run Jesus off. Nothing you can do to get him to betray you or to reject you. That is some kind of love. So we know we can't, that we never leave his love. But he is telling us to remain in a mentality, especially when we've been shredded, especially when we feel torn up, especially when we feel torn down, that there's no more important time to keep ourselves in the mentality of, I am loved by God. I am loved by my God. No matter what, no matter where I've been, no matter what has happened to me, no matter what kind of paths I come out of, no matter how foolish that was this morning, no matter how foolish that was yesterday, this I do know. As torn down as I feel, I am loved by my God. I will keep myself in the love of God. I told a young man not very long ago, that was going through such a difficult time, such a mighty, mighty young man of God. Have you ever known, I mean, you saw someone so gifted, so powerfully gifted, but they had just enough edge to them that you kind of were afraid the enemy was going to get a target on them. Just, I mean, just open enough where you thought, oh, and especially because I'm the age that I am, I know what it's like to be had. I know what it's like to not see um, a, a hole coming and to fall head long into the bottom of a dry well. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I know what it's like. So when I, I look and see younger brothers and sisters that I know the enemy is after with everything he's got. One of the things that I'll think of, and I, I, I wrote this young man and said after a deep, um, deep uh, hurt had happened and after he had just in his mind blown it in every way and blown his calling to bits. Keep yourself in the love of God, that as you heal up every single day, you echo that over and over again. Listen, I, I just say this to you. I hope you always have somebody around you that's going, your God loves you, your God loves you, your God loves you, your God loves you. I hope you have somebody doing that. But you know what the word of God says? You can do it with yourself. Because the word of God says it is true. You don't have to have anybody give you permission to feel loved by the God of the universe. You just already are. You just already are. We keep looking for other people to affirm us. Listen, when nobody else is around, you can still look in the mirror and go, this I know, based on the authority of the scriptures, I am loved by my God, and nothing I have done has run him off. Anybody getting that with me? I mean, it, it doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better than that. There's this wonderful time. Many of you may be familiar with it, but I just love it. At the very end of 1 Samuel, in chapter 30, verse 6, David is beside himself. The enemy has come and, um, and uh, come against the, um, the uh, people that have uh, gathered around him and followed him. Uh, all the men were off um, fighting a battle, and the women and the kids were taken. They've been kidnapped. They're just all completely beside themselves. And it says in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 30, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Strengthened himself. I love the King James rendering. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. 
I hope you always have someone to encourage you. I'd want to. I'd want to. Many of you are sitting next to somebody that you have mutual encouragement with. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. But what if nobody is there? What if nobody is there? Do you have a relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ through his word to where you know what is true about the way he feels about you? Do you know it? Do you know it? Because listen, sometimes there is no one there. Sometimes nobody's going to come along and encourage you in the Lord. Sometimes there's not going to be somebody there to go, you're really a wonderful person of great value. You are highly esteemed. All of these things that would be true, but nobody's there to say it. Could you know what is true based on the authority of the scriptures? That's what I'm asking you. Building yourselves up in the most holy faith, knowing that what he says is true, being able to rehearse it in our own ears, saying it with our mouth, believing it with our heart. I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer loves me, has given his life for me, been raised from the dead in my behalf and left a tomb empty for me. I know my God loves me. You know, sometimes a wound doesn't heal just right until it gets hit again. Anybody? Been hit in the same place over and over, and then one day you go, you know what, I think I'm ready to get over that now. <laughs> yeah, I think now, since I've been back in this cycle about five times, and I've been hurt in the same way over and over, had the same taste in men, the same taste in women, the same taste in relationships, over, I've had this, been doing the same thing, the same one over, and then one day it gets hit again, and you think, you know, maybe now would be a great time to start getting over it. Um, just just here about a, um, a week and a half ago, our bird dog, you know, uh, James and Betty and Keith and I are all dog freaks. And Keith and I have two dogs. He has a bird dog and I have a border collie. And um, our, our bird dog um, was just sitting, um, sitting kind of um, uh, uh, rolled up in kind of an odd way, shaking on the couch. And, and my grandkids were over. My kids were over. So a lot was going on. So I had not noticed that anything was wrong. But Amanda looked over at her. I've been getting supper ready and just been active with the kids and all. Amanda looked over and went, oh, Mother, she's hurt. And we looked carefully at her. And she had, well, I'm not going to really describe it too much to you. Well, I probably am. But, I mean, I am talking a gash this big in her side. That we have a gate, we have a, a really old iron fence in our backyard, and the gate is one of those kind that you pull it up and you slip it um, into a slot like this. That's how you open it and close it. And this portion is, um, is, is pointed. And somehow, it's, this is what had happened to her because it was exactly that height, and it happened to one of our other uh, animals. It just is going to have to be um, totally redone to keep it from happening. But she had obviously pushed it through, and when she did, instead of waiting for it to open, I kind of had tension on it, and it just ripped right through her side. And it was awful. Y'all, it was awful. I, honestly, it was so grotesque that I had to sit down. I, I thought, honest, I'm going to have to honestly have a glass of water before I can even deal with the dog. We took her to the emergency um, animal ER because why? Well, because it never happens when your normal vet is just simply open. <laughs> no, no, it has to be to the tune of you know how many dollars. Well, um, because it had been a while since she'd been out, by the time they took us, we were there about two hours before they ever took us in. By the time the vet saw us, she said, how long has it been? And I said, well, I'm not positive, but I said, I said, she had been running um, out on our acres. It had been a, two hours before we ever saw, before we ever realized she was hurt. She'd been in the house since then. But I said, she'd just been kind of curled up. We didn't know anything was wrong. And um, then she'd waited two more hours until they got to her. And so by this time, she goes, oh, well, she said, that's, that's the bad part of not being able to get her in right away. And I said, what do you mean? And y'all stay with me here just a second. She said, well, what we're going to have to do, and she said, she won't feel it because she'll be completely, this will be completely deadened. But she said, notice that that skin is already curling under. And she said, it's not going back together. It's curling under. She said, what I'm going to have to do is I will have to go back around it, and I will have to then 
cut the edges all over again and give them the signal to heal. It was like, you have got to be kidding me. And she said, then at that point, with it cleaned out and recut, I can sew it back together and it knows it will begin to heal itself. It was fascinating to me, fascinating. Because I thought, how often does that happen? Where we just let a gash go instead of letting him tend to it. And it's not until it's cut again that we go, now I'm ready to lay still, let you do what it takes to pull my hand away and invite you, get to this wound and heal me. Some of you are just convinced that you're going to have to live with this thing, this mental stronghold, this addiction, this, this uh, very destructive way of life. Um, this um, career infidelity uh, for the rest of your life, that is not true in Christ. That is not true in Christ. You can, you can find wholeness in Him. You can find healing for your mind and healing for your emotions. I want to turn you to scriptures I love so much. In Isaiah 61, before we conclude, Isaiah 61, and I want to show you something. Isaiah 61, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 to you. Um, These verses are so precious to me. They're precious to many of you. If you're familiar with them, um, you love them for your own reasons because it talks about what becomes the ministry of Christ in Luke chapter 4. This is... Um, the job description that God gives to his own son that he fulfills um, in his earthly ministry and in his death and his resurrection. But it's so beautiful because it's about setting um, the captive free and the release to the prisoners. And listen what it says. And there's one part I want you to see in verse 4, but let me get there. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those, I'm in verse 3, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they might be called the oaks of righteousness, the plant of the Lord that he may be glorified watch what happens next in verse 4 look carefully they shall build up the ancient ruins they shall raise up the former devastations they shall repair the ruined cities the devastations of many generations they shall build it back up they shall repair it I want you to stay with me for just a moment because I want to just suggest to you that maybe few things in the entire human experience that we can go through are more Christ-like and more like our God than not only when we build, but we rebuild. Not only when we create, but we repair. I want you to think about that if we had not had a God willing to reconstruct, the world would have ended in the days of Noah. I want to suggest to you that it takes um, creativity, ingenuity, um, its own kind of faith to create something, to do a work from scratch. But I'd like to just push you a little bit further and say there may not be anything that is more Christ-like than when it all falls apart that you are willing to work with God to see that thing come back together. We just move on to the next thing and leave it in crumbles, but there's no redemption. What happens when a people, when a person will go? Let's take a deep breath. I'm willing to go to work. Let's rebuild. Somebody listening today is rebuilding a business, um, rebuilding a marriage, rebuilding a home, uh, rebuilding a devastated reputation, Uh, rebuilding a body after an accident. It takes a whole different thing than just starting something from scratch. Because it doesn't just take creativity. Somebody stay with me here. It takes commitment. Commitment. Whole different kind of faith. 
and that God would do it in the first place. But would he do it in the second place? Would he do it in the third place? Would he do it in the fourth place? That takes a whole different level of faith. That takes some perseverance, some perseverance. That aspect of bearing God's image that can only come from joining him in not just building, but rebuilding, rebuilding. Here's what I want to say to you as we end. I want you to appreciate what may be one of the most beautiful prefixes in the entire English vocabulary in Scripture, and those are the two letters, R-E. Beautiful, beautiful letters. I just want you to appreciate today the re in restoration, the re in renewal, the re in return, the re in remember, the re in rejoice, the re in reconcile, the re in repair, the re in replant, and the re in rebuild. Because somebody is so stuck in the re of regret. that they can't get to the rebuild. This I promise you, based on the authority of the Word of God, He wants to put you back together again.